on. It's easy nowadays because you can And we are going to call it. the meeting to order. This is where it is. Right now. Order, order. You want yes. a back massage? Order. Yeah. We're in the court. Okay. Um, are there any considerations for additions or modifications to the agenda? No. Did you have anything that you were going to bring up? Or? Did you want me to keep Duncan quiet? Uh, I, don't remember Duncan. Big hard as well. I don't remember, but I do have an executive session that I would like to hold. Okay, at the end. Sure. Um, I would yeah. like to say that the tractor parade this weekend was awesome. It was awesome. Oh, that's very good. Did you get my email about the library bits? Yes. Yes. Do you want to discuss that tonight or a different meeting? Uh, we'll do that next Monday. Perfect. Do we have time to do it for next Monday? Uh, maybe we just will have the trustees wait to review bits. Uh, yeah, they haven't reviewed them yet. I'd like to get their feedback. Yeah, they were going to open them next Thursday, review next Thursday. Because they are going to wait for they're look, waiting for one more bid before they open them. For the electric. I thought that's what your email was about. Yeah, it was more about like point of, point of order, what, what the select board wants to do to extend the deadline or to accept the uh, only bid. Our, before I make this an agenda, potential agenda item, are you working with Ron on the RFP and the question marks around putting that RFP together for the municipal building? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. we uh, just came in tonight, and um, that was actually on my list to do today, but we're pulling the library as a template to then move forward with the municipal building. Okay. And I don't think we need to discuss it as a board, probably. I've been now going to do it anyways. Okay. Um, so I'm going to add the, an executive session at the end, and... I think that before we kick off, so thanks for everybody everybody who's here. Thank you very much, not only for being here tonight, but for everything you did for the flood and for us in emergency management. I'll speak for Evan, Evan. <laughs> uh, but we really do appreciate it, so thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone knows Tom. Tom, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, Tom Gallinat, the sixth day of uh, town administrator for Johnson. Um, so I probably will forget your name, but I'll remember your life story. <laughs> and uh, so I look forward to meeting all of you and working together. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, Donna, is there anyone here you don't know? Um, I think I, I can see your name is Vicky, unless you're wearing someone else's jacket. No, this is my last name. Yeah, Foster. Foster, okay. Um, and I guess I'm wondering if Tom wants to be Tom or Thomas in the minutes. Oh, uh, Tom, Tom is fine. Thank you. Okay. And Vicky's with NEMS. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So tonight we are going to basically go through the activity of building out the timeline for the first, for the initial emergency response. Um, I know a number of you have your own reports. That's great. The town does not, and that's what we're trying to accomplish for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And would love your input uh, in that so we can have a comprehensive. Uh, timeline of events because uh, there was a lot that happened over a matter of 48 hours. Um, so we are going to start with um, probably Sunday because I think Evan kicked off a couple of things on Sunday um, the 9th and then go through uh, Wednesday um, mid to late afternoon-ish. We'll figure out where the right time is once we feel like we're starting to talk about um, recovery and stabilization as opposed to immediate emergency response. Uh, but that's our goal for tonight. So, um, are we going to do sticky notes of time and move them around or just really talk about it, have it in the minutes? What I think I would so. love to do is I'd like to be able to pick things up and move them if we can. Um, so, I think doing sticky notes would be helpful and visual, and maybe if a couple people would help with writing out those sticky notes as we discuss so that one person can keep writing and we can keep talking, and we have you know two or three people uh, serving that function, uh, if anyone's willing to do that. 
and we'll put them we'll just put them up along that wall um so we'll start with sunday with what you kicked off with and go from there sunday wasn't the big uh, well can we get volunteers before you start talking about it though huh before you start talking yeah. about it yeah other volunteers you want to help break you can look down <laughs> <laughs> i can take half of that and do i'll take some yeah Anyone else want to write? Okay. Okay. Uh, can... Cool. So go ahead, Evan. My heavily detailed notes only start at 3 p.m. On Sunday? On Monday and That's go okay. until like 9 a.m. Tuesday ish. Maybe it was 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. <clears throat> okay. No, 3 p.m. Uh, so. Sunday wasn't really much at all other than just monitoring what was going on and trusting the weather. Uh, Monday morning around 6.30 I Can talked. I just clarify on Sunday, you, got, you basically got alerts from the yeah. state emergency yeah. management. Right. Anyone Saying else? that there's a potential flood risk. Okay. That's all. Yeah. And in checking the National Weather Service, the flood was scheduled to be 14 feet. At a crest uh, Sunday night. Monday morning, I started out by calling the previous emergency management director and getting some guidance. That was six, six thirty. It was early. Um, we talked about what a fourteen foot flood has looked like in the past. They can all be unique. Um, I got contact information for Pomalol Properties and Merchants Bank and a couple of others. He probably gave me Roger's post number, office. but I already had it. The post office, yep. I could look through that. Okay. Uh, so I called all of the contacts that he recommended. Um, I put 14 foot stage and let them know that they could experience some flooding uh, to prepare. <coughs> and then talked to you, Beth, and we kind of agreed that we would need a select board meeting that night, you know, seeing how things would go. I talked with Eric Bailey, who was the emergency operations coordinator. Um, kind of put him on Notice that we'd see flooding. Still at this time, they were calling for a 14 foot crest. So I didn't think it would be bad. <laughs> um, around 10 o'clock p.m. a.m. Monday, when we found out the National Weather Service moved it from a 14 foot crest to an 18 foot crest, which drastically changed my haste in calling people and at some point I had talked to the library I don't know if it was 14 feet or 18 feet about them preparing and I called and talked with Daryl West about things they would need for support or what an average flood looks like. We talked about there was a request for sandbags from the fire department. Um, and being my first emergency, I didn't know the exact protocol. Um, that gets us through to about 11. It was just nonstop phone calls to people that would flood, select board members, public works, library, fire department. Roger Marco. I don't know exactly when we talked. We talked a lot, <laughs> yeah. but most of it was in the afternoon that day. Can we stop there for a second? I just want to make sure, does anyone have anything that they want to add to any of those Sunday through midday? Beth, yeah, uh, I wasn't exactly sure exactly what we were doing tonight, but you might be able to pull a lot of information up by dispatch in terms of times if you're establishing a timeline for a report. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, we can do that. Perfect. We'll I'm going to start right from probably the camp. Yeah. Right through the 
Tuesday, Wednesday. Friday. Yeah, we're looking kind of at the first 48-ish, so. I mean, honestly, we're probably going to ask for more later. So if you have a way to queue in on flood events, that would be great. Can you sort it by location? Or I guess it could um, just be all the data and we could sort it. Yeah, I might have to put somebody listening to the recording, right? Because things are date stamped if we punch an incident on something. But before we got going with Johnson, we were up in, in Woke. Yeah. You know, we're not up there. So. I'll, I'll try to get with the crew and see what we can do with it. Then you say you're going to need something later, but just let me know what you need when you need it, and we'll try to get it. Perfect. Uh, we'll probably do something like this if this goes well. Okay. Uh, Eric, did you have anything you want to add, or are you good? No, right. I don't think I've been called in yet. Not yet. I meant other Eric. I meant good Eric. Oh, you're He's on Zoom. Eric. You're talking to good Eric. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're at about 11 a.m. noonish. 11 a.m. noonish. At that point, uh, around that time, I think that I texted the select board members and just said we're going to have an emergency meeting time TBD. Yeah, which the meeting ended up being 3:15, right? Yeah. Mm, no, it was 4:30. Oh, let's keep moving, actually. We can look up the time. That's not a big deal. Okay, so we met at 4.30. We talked about a bunch of logistics that we can see in the minutes. Well, before 4, yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's kind of when my larger events were logged for a little bit in downtime. At 3.05, I had talked with Roger about the water at the bridge in Wolka. He had said that it was coming up, and I texted that to RJ that it was coming up. That I still don't know exactly where the bridge is. RJ was saying that, or not, yeah. He was saying that it was a good indication <coughs> as the Johnson flood waters are a four hour lag, three to four. When? Usually about an eight hour lag. Okay. So their measurement, a good benchmark for us is a bridge over a flat iron road up by the Calum River and flood fire department. On the Lamoille? Yes. Okay. So at 305 the water was coming up and talked to the fire department. I apologize, I think I said Daryl earlier and then RJ. I was wondering why I said Daryl. Yeah, I'm with it. Uh, at 311, uh, I talked with Brian Raleigh Nice and Jason about the situation at the library. Uh, and Jason showed me pictures of all the wonderful dirt piled up, uh, flood proofing there. And then my notes say at 3.15 we went into the select board meeting. At 3.15 we did go into the select board meeting, you're right. When did Pomeroy start? I mean, it seems like they were there throughout the day bringing dirt in and I talked flood prep. I talked to a couple different people in Palm Walls between 7 and noon five or six times. Yeah. Cause so I didn't, I wasn't, yeah. obviously every call is not logged. This is just kind of like the larger events that I had time to write mm -hmm. down, and I'm sure things will pop up yeah. for everybody, hopefully not just me. I'd say their contractor started around 7. And getting dirt and sand Monday out. morning they yeah. started around. Yeah, they they seem to be really <coughs> in game with, with dirt and plywood and skid steers. And there was the time that we called the select board meeting. I left work at two that day. I already wrote this down. I left work at two, and I went down and got supplies because I figured at that point we were not going to probably leave the office. <laughs> Little did I know it was going to flood. Uh, but I didn't think we were probably going to leave the office for 48 hours or so. So I got food and drinks and your macaroni and cheese. Yeah, microwave macaroni and cheese. Yeah. Best stuff I've ever had. <laughs> uh, so I got supplies like that. So we had food. What 
which in hindsight was really good because I'm not sure we would have got food, <laughs> frankly. Uh, okay. So at 3.15 we called the emergency meeting, uh, emerge we declared an emer That's emergency. That's when all the select board members were present, right? Uh -huh. Out of that meeting... Um, and, and the fire department was there. Yeah, fire department was there. I believe Roger was there, there as well. Yeah. Eric was there. Um, there was discussions about getting out an early notice, and I do, was that gotten out to? So it was gotten out to everybody that was going to be affected for where the crest was going to be that night. Right, which was still 18 roads, feet at that time. In the roads that were going to be affected for, so everybody on River Road East, now past one Brook Bridge, and uh, on Lundling Lane were notified the water of the road were probably going to be impassable because of the water coming up. And okay. As far as the Western Road, everything was notified as far as stuff that was going to be where it was supposed to flood. Yeah. So, Jason, you notified Lineway Lane and all the residents on River Road East from, from Waterman Brook on? Yeah, pretty much. That's where I did because there's no houses that get affected from that bridge point on. But not River Road West. I mean, uh, whatever the local. The only ones I talked to down there were the people that were lower on the road, Ellis, and, yeah. Elbert, and Ellis' son, and stuff that were thinking that they were going to be affected how it came up the last time. Yeah. Nobody in the mobile home, lower mobile home park. Nobody as far as above the skate park now. Below the skate park, though. Uh, only thing below the skate park, we were just telling people that the water was going to come up to an 18 foot crest right. or whatever was on that paper. I think the prediction was 18 feet until it wasn't. Until it wasn't. It wasn't. Until until two o'clock. <laughs> well put. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was until two, until after two o'clock because the two o'clock was supposed to be the last time it was supposed to spike before we had to leave the building and they hadn't updated it at two o'clock. Yeah. So leading up to two o'clock, a lot happened. Holy cow. Two o'clock in the morning? Yeah. Oh. So I can still get up to? Yep. like I don't know, like high events. Uh, there was kind of a lull and phone calls a little bit between the end of our select board meeting on uh, four twenty. At four twenty. Uh, I talked to the EOC reiterating trying to find out how bad the flood was going to be. Um, uh, 421, uh, Jason gave a pallet of sandbags to the post office. Again, you know, these aren't perfect notes all the time because it's only when you have 10 seconds to write it down. At 451, uh, Jason, in case anybody doesn't know every time I say Jason, I'm just talking about Jason Whale. Uh, he called to inform us that River Road East was closed at Waterman Brook because of water, and the residents were informed again at 420, 451, I believe. Can you pause there for a second? I don't um, know, I kind of, I did jump almost three hours there. I just, hopefully other people have stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, Tim, can you put yourself on mute for one second? Yep. Okay, Eric. We're ready, Eric. Oh, sorry. I gotta take that. We're, ready. We're ready, Eric. Can you, hear me? you can hear me? Can you hear me? Bueller? The audio might be. Too I don't cold. think you can hear me. Somebody down there is talking because of the See, he's microphone. Talking. I don't have. Oh. Um, Are you muted? Hold on one second. I don't know what. Go ahead. Jason, did you have um, one of those sandbagger things? That we oh, you're not muted. I don't see you muted. I don't put the bag in. Hello, Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. We hear you now.
Oh, you can hear me. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I was waving my hand since we passed about noon, so I'm behind in the schedule. Um, strong afternoon, basically, you know, early afternoon when Evan got the higher crest notification and put it out. I had the water and light crew stage vehicles on high ground, well, we thought it was high ground. Some of them were high, were high enough ground, others were not, on the you know main village side of the river, and I went home, grabbed bedding, and pulls for them. Okay, I'm done. You did that too, didn't you, Jason? Yeah, we brought all the equipment, our equipment from the lower staging area, our lower storage area, and put it up top. What we could fit in our building and the rest was put outside. And then to answer Mark's question, we took an old road cone and just cut it and mounted the thing to make some sandbag. We, we stored a bunch down below from uh, the ice The winter flood. flood. Yeah. yeah. So we had some and we made a bunch more up Monday. When we were doing the library of prep and stuff, and to have some on hand for residents. Yeah. We'll do that by hand. Yeah. And then, like Evan was saying, as far as the public works permit, uh, we went out after the meeting and were monitoring the roads that were going to be affected and handed out the notices. Uh, <clears throat> for after we ended up closing the road east, and roughly the same time for one way, a little, little while after we closed that section down through there. Mm -hmm. Around 4 50, 5 o'clock. Lenway? I say I think they did that, you know, written down. I know when I called first. I have it here somewhere, too. At, the, at that at that height, so Evan, the the lower mobile home park was still predicted. To yeah, this is only this is only around 5 p.m. Yeah, yeah and the water. There was still daylight. Oh, I know it was still daylight, but I was just saying we were. The prediction was 18 feet at 5 p.m. No. Two or around. Yeah. Well, high point was supposed to be at two feet, two a.m. Yeah, two a.m. 18 feet was no, supposed to be two a.m. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, that was still the prediction at five, at five. Okay. Yeah. That's I mean, it was still the prediction at two. Yeah. <laughs> Say from, so around two o'clock for us, uh, it, I was the only one in at the time. And then I noticed water started coming in the lower parking lot where the water lights, poles and stuff were stored. So I called Nate and asked him if he wanted me to start moving them. And he said yes. And then I called in Ryan and we proceeded to move them, and before we had them all moved, which was about 80 poles, give or take, the water was already a foot and a half in the lower staging area, and it was only about an hour and a half. And I thought, well, since when I called him, told him we got to move. What time is that? I called Ryan. It was uh, 1.30, I think, 1.36. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think it's... Yeah, see, that goes beyond my... Seems like about yeah, I didn't call you when this was happening. So for that, I know we talked see. about the poles, yeah. and you guys were going to move them. Yeah. And by the time we got the poles moved, shortly after that, we got a call from our dad. It was just barely getting daylight about the rescue so the, one. Even before that, um, the first time I made a website update was at 9.12. And we had Lundway Road, uh, Lundway Lane closed, and River Road East closed. Um, and at that point, we were expected to peak at 18.2 feet at 2 a.m. So I have 5, 11 in my notes is when Lundway Lane was closed. Five in the afternoon. I think it was earlier than that. It could have been. <coughs> I don't know if it was much earlier than that because it comes over on River Road, up onto the road a little bit before it does one way. And the time we came back down, we already had uh, probably eight to inches on one way. 
the one I called him about uh, the roadies. And we put road pole signs, and from there I went down to monitor the hogback because that's the next place it comes or starts coming over for us road wise is down there. Okay, maybe then, um, maybe the time's wrong on the website, like the clock it uses on the Well, server. that was at 9 p.m. Right? Oh, that was at 9, yeah, yeah. So, like, there was nine. multiple. Levels. It was already closed, but... Yeah. So, so oh, if it's over Lenway, is it in the lower mobile home park? No, there's a section of Lenway. From see, I, I don't yeah. know. It. There's from, a real low... From, just below our sand pile. Before okay. starts staging area, there's a dip right there, and it's the lowest spot. Okay. That way, fishermen access there as well, and it always comes up there. Okay. It'd just be nice to have these indicators say, okay, Lenway's under, that means everything... You know, yeah. what else is there? What else is under? And around that same time, the waterman side of... Because this is different. I have a new entry that says River Road East is closed past Waterman Brook. Yep. Um, so that was a later closure. It was closed earlier. I don't know when we posted it. Because there was a hundred phone calls. Yeah, I called them. Okay. Uh, multiple people stopping in at the office to keep us updated on what was happening in that time frame. About 100 feet past uh, the Waterman Brook Bridge, that's where it comes up the same time as it does Lenway, roughly. And it comes out into the road and crosses into the cornfield there. And it fills in that and it runs back towards the brook. While we're talking about Lenway, uh, exact time, I don't have a clue. Uh, but I did talk with Jackie Casino, I'm pretty sure I got her contact from Beth about the potential risk of somebody being stranded down there and informed her that, it, I think it goes without saying, but just kind of said, like, if it comes to life or limb, they're driving on the rail trail. And so the state was informed that we would be using it if need be. I don't think it matters because if somebody's at risk, people are going to do whatever they can anyways. So they had two backup plans. They were going to take the rail trail as long as they could if they thought they were in danger. And then they were in, there's a four-wheel trail that goes from their place up on top of uh, Upper French that they were going to use if it come down to it. Beth, I'd like to add that when we staged the water and lights department with us around the same time the sewer treatment plant's floodgates went in and it was put to bed. Yeah, good point, okay. What time is that? Right around the time of your meeting. I think that's when you're at 315 ish. Eric would probably remember better, but. Um, we can let Eric talk again. Just to fix I'm this pretty up. sure when I pulled in, because I left work at 2 also, but I had to stop at my house and get stuff to spend the night or whatever, or plan to. And I'm pretty sure I remember pulling into that select board meeting a little bit before 3, and one of your village crew was getting out of the truck to stage it there, so that time frame makes perfect sense. I know the 802 Solutions guys were dealing with Morrisville at the same time. You know, pretty sure they went by the Hardwick's sewer treatment plants guys' board. That's why they shut it down, put the gates up, prepared for the flood in there. Eric, does that all if it make <coughs> sense? you want to add anything? If you do, I just need to turn the speaker on. Oh, I gotta mute. Yeah, okay. Let's let's let Eric talk for a second. Can I can you clarify um River? Wait, Road? hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, you hear me. No, I, I couldn't hear what was being said. That sounds about right. Yeah, okay. River, River Road East is on, wait, let's, let's My gate's wait. about three. I think Dan left at about eight. Okay. I think it's worth... Um, Tim, can you go back off mute? Thank you. What did you say again, Mark? I just wanted clarity that... I'm very curious about why places flood. And River Road East flooded because of the Lamoille, not Waterman. It seemed like it was all Lamoille that yep. caused River Road East to flood. This flood 
It did. It was all the home oil. Yeah. It did most of all That's the damage. That's what was different about this flood. Yeah. It was a different flood. No, that I think I, I agree with you because we've had a lot of floods where the guy was going crazy and it didn't do the damage that this one did because the home oil was up so high. See, it was only on the road for uh, over Jason, the will you speak up? Because you don't have a mic near you. I think we all just need to make sure we're speaking loudly. The, on Rocky Road, uh, it, the water was only over the road about eight inches for only half of it for about an hour, hour and a half yeah. when when it was up and it went right back down within two hours, but that was after it crested. And Romero's place didn't flood. Yeah. And that place floods at the drop of a hat and it eats anyway. Yeah. The powerhouse bridge is my scale and no, it never looked like it should have flooded anywhere in Johnson by the mm -hmm. that bridge. Right. Back. But the oil was so high, it backed Absolutely. the guy on up and it decided to come through my yard, <laughs> down to Railroad Street. I think it's worth pointing out, too, if we're, if we're identifying things that were done. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but you guys went out and did some work on the roads, like put in some water bar, water bar cutouts and things like that, uh, some preventive maintenance that I think was very effective in that morning we did protecting I, our roads. We were wondering where we were going to be at as far as the water <coughs> accumulation from the storm. So we we did around went around to all the roads and put cutouts in where it needed to be. And yeah. that would have been Sunday. Oh, yeah, that was Monday morning. Monday. As soon as we started, I sent uh, the back of the loader and the tractor were out doing that. Yeah. So the reason so I think that's important to get in here is I think that was very effective. We had. Though we had a lot of high water damage, we didn't have a lot of road damage. And I think at least some of that was due to the preventive maintenance that we faced in the road. Uh, I just want to get back to our timeline for a second because at some point, and again, I have at 9.37, so... <coughs> What's the first post? No, I'm changing topics. At 9.37, around the same time as the road closures, um, the confirmation that the college was ready to be a shelter occurred because I posted that at that time I posted that this shelter was available for overnight using the back entrance parking lot. Yeah, um, so the college, uh, Mike Patagonia, yeah. I had talked to on Monday morning about the potential need for shelter use. Um, I talked to him a couple other times during the day, and I believe around that nine o'clock <coughs> mark was when I called him and said, that "It looks like we're going to need it. So, could you get public safety there or whatever and get the back entrance open?" And the college was very accommodating for multiple things. And then we confirmed later in the evening how many beds. Yeah. Because we confirmed that we wanted 20 and we thought that only a couple people would come. Yeah. We were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> is the college a designated shelter or is that a decision that It's our made? designated, one of our designated shelters in emergency management, local emergency management plan. When did you think you talked to Mike? Asking for the beds? Uh, Ish. I have this report here, but I don't see that your initial call in it. When did I initially call him in the morning?
initially. And the college set up a meeting internally at 2 p.m. with a bunch of the facilities folks um, for logistics and finding extra mat mattresses. It was on Monday at 2 p.m. Anything that you want to add, anyone, at this point? Yeah. Could we, we keep a list just as things come up of uh, ideas so that we can talk about them later? Yeah, do you want to go right ahead first? Yeah, yeah. Um, as the county. Actually, why don't we just put this around? I would take a couple of you want to take notes on it. Take a few for action items, and we can address them afterward. So we're You're talking about lessons learned kind of a thing? Well, no, I'm talking about, like, we need COTS, we need MREs. Yeah, put those on that list. Yeah, grab a couple. We'll collect them afterward. So the, uh, I have a process question sort of related to that. If Is you just the, want to take a few, Roger, off the top and keep them there, we'll collect them at the end in case more ideas come up. I'm fine with doing the timeline thing, but my the thing I'm more concerned about is are there things that we need to do differently or better the next time? Is this exercise going to help us we have two get to that point? Full of that. Yeah, we do. Uh, if you want the list of things that Beth and I and Ken, some other people have come up with for improvements to local emergency management plan, it would be easier if I picked them all out and send them. That's going to be everybody this year if you want. Um, I think this is cataloging what happened, and even now, I mean, two months out, there's other things that could have been done better that maybe we didn't think about during the time. So to me, that's more important than, I mean, I, I, I get to me, cataloging like, if the If we don't catalog this right now, we're never going to do it, and I would like to do it because I don't really. I'm not, I'm not, not suggesting that we shouldn't do it. I'm we suggesting that an equally important, if not more important around, part, is figuring out what we need to do differently. Okay. If Alan? Yep. So where are we? We're at 3 o'clock on Monday? 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Yes. Monday. I keep jumping to 7 p.m. Yeah, all over the place. Who, yeah. And um, have you talked to Roger by that time? Oh, or four or five times. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe. Okay. My next note is 5.07 p.m. Talk with Roger. Um, this is before, so 507 is before the 100% we are doing a shelter at the college because Roger said that he would be willing to call Hyde Park Fire Department and see if they'd be willing to shelter Johnson residents. Still, the flood's going to be peaked at 18 feet, uh, you know, um, before the fire. <coughs> to move to the college. And Roger, were you in Wolkin at 5 o'clock? No, I did in, in Wolcott, um, probably started late afternoon, and it was dark by the last rescue we had up there. What I had done earlier is assigned, beside the patrol guy, I assigned an extra patrol person for each town. And so, it was dark up there when we got done, and I'm guessing that was around 8 o'clock. late. At what point was Wolka isolated though? It started daylight in the late afternoon. That's what I would have thought too. <clears throat> but we knew it was Lamoille River this time because of the damage that we were hearing from Hardwick and that unbelievable damage in, in uh, Wolka, you know, the fire department, the town highway, that bridge for the real trail. So we knew it was you know, as we Did you know about what the problems they were having up there? That would I would be handy for. I talked with Roger. And almost every single time I talked with Roger, I called RJ. <laughs> he, he's blocked my number by now. <laughs> Until next time. <clears throat> but I think that open communication the whole time. If anything, he probably wanted me to call him less. But so, did any time. 
did you you folks disbelieve the 18 feet? At 5.11 p.m., I have a wonderful note that the river was at 14.13 feet, so it was still pretty promising that it was going to be really high, uh, other than Wolka. But I, I, I kind of thought that this was going to be bad construction <coughs> for the and the fact that we had cars stuck in, in different pockets of movement. They hadn't happened before in their experience. Before. I even had a deputy that was stopping traffic on Route 15 just before woke up the village that just about gets stranded there. I may be wrong about this, but I think when we opened the shelter at like 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning, they were still calling for oh, No, well, we opened it earlier than that. That 3 o'clock in the morning is when everything was... Well, that's when I got crazy. Yeah. yeah. I but, called. But, I called you when I was on. When I was bringing rosemary home. Yeah, like four o'clock. Yeah, but I, my point is, I think they. I think the National Weather Service was still calling for something like an eighteen and a half or nineteen. They were. It was eighteen point two yeah. until two a.m. No, the, the the recorded levels got higher than the projection that you were watching the. You know the projection during that time period. The recorded levels were up above where the projection was. So, it, See, it so seems. Eric has something he wants to add to the part of the conversation that happened a minute ago. Tim, can we do it again? Well, very soon we'll get another point where everybody has to do that. Hopefully. It seems to me that we ought to trust the people upstream more than the National Weather Service. Mm -hmm. I have to say, it. if Rogers and Wolk get the same, Christ, I've never seen it this bad. We're watching Harvard Motel come down the river, and they're saying it's going to be 18 feet. I mean, Roger never, to my reflection, told me, don't worry about it. He gave me status reports, and I reported them mm -hmm. to. But meanwhile, the we're down to the peaceful way. Let's cancel that plan. He doesn't have anything to add. I guess not. So, I mean, maybe this would be an area to improve in that situation. I, I believe you were Sorry, what was the area to improve? I don't know if we were telling people 18 feet. People we were telling people 18 feet because that's what was being reported. Right. And my question is at what point do we trust the people upriver and Roger and Wilkett? and other people versus the National Weather Service. I mean, if you're well, seeing this, look at being isolated, you've never seen it before, and we're still thinking, oh, it's going to be 18 feet, it's going to be a little damp here in, in the library and in Sterling. We didn't when it was clear that we couldn't trust the data we had. So yeah. there was a point where we could not trust the data. Yeah. Before that, Overnight, we watching. Don't know, we know. Yeah. Yeah. When, at what point was that that you felt that we didn't trust the data? When we were coming up at 2, 2 a.m., I said to Evan, that trend line is straight up. I watch trend lines. Trend lines do not just drop when they're going straight up like this. It's mm -hmm. going to keep rising where it's not slowing down. And also at the same time, Roger is calling, saying that more still flooding. Uh, and RJ was saying, because you guys had gone out already, and you had said that you were seeing problems, and you had guys, you weren't sure we were going to be able to get back to Johnson on uh, mutual aid. So we were using all of, but what are you going to do at that point? Like, at that point, we're flooded. Yeah, no, that's why I'm wondering if, if we're eight hours behind Wolkett, and Wolkett's underwater, we ought to really know we're, we're in for deep water. I, I couldn't tell you how bad it was going to get down here. It was, just bad there. What I can tell you is that I thought that the management leadership here in Johnson um, did a real good job trying to keep up with this thing. Uh, I had not seen the water rise that Monday night or in the Tuesday morning. I hadn't seen it rise that fast before. And so we're, we're trying to think about what we're going to do. We can get some people out of the house the first one or two times that we get on the apartments. We couldn't get them out. We said, oh, we're going to write it out until it was much more challenging for rescuers to get in there and try to get them out. I mean, the other thing is you can only use the data you have. 
and the data is from different sources. It's from the different people telling us things, and it's from the measurements that we are watching. And literally, through the entire event until we had to pick up and leave, I was hitting refresh, watching the lever levels that were being recorded. Even though they only get recorded every 30 minutes or so, which yeah. is way too long, uh, I was still sitting there pushing refresh. I still check when it's raining out of habit. I, um, <clears throat> I'd like to say I'm a little frustrated. Because if I'd have known that information that he knew at 8 o'clock, I could have got more notices out to people that would have been affected. You would know that the water level was so high up. They knew it was bad up there like they've never seen before at 8 when they were doing evacs. If we'd have known that down here and we weren't predict you know, going on the weather's 18, we could have got more notices out. We I bet the village guys would have moved the pole before we would have, you know, there would have been stuff we could have saved more stuff in the lower building. I think we would have done a lot more knowing, you know, information is power. I mean, the more you know, the more you can do. I'd just like to say that I would kept checking on the sewer treatment plant. That was my concern until the next morning. Um, at 7.48 that yeah. night, the water was just about to crest onto the pavement at the plant. Two hours later, you couldn't get down from the fire department down. That water come up three and a half. In two hours at that time. So it, was, it was unprecedented. And like he said, you couldn't really tell. He, he wanted to know if Guillaume was causing issues with us at the same time. So, and we we all would be thankful that Guillaume didn't because it would have been way worse. Yeah, that's true. We did have people telling us about the levels of the Guillaume um, throughout the night. Roger was telling us. We had um, Brian. Was here at our meeting that night. Brian R. Yeah. He, he was in the library. He was in the library the whole year. The entire time, also, when he was looking to go over the other day. And I don't know if he showed us a ton of those. I, Eric, I was a good stopped in at one point. <laughs> you know, Mark, you stopped in three or four times to tell us how the guy on was looking and stuff, right? Yeah. So we were getting reports and. So let's fast forward. Geez, I am going to make a note about that. I, I was contacting RJ. Uh, First experience for a lot of people, for sure, um, and reporting stuff <coughs> from Roger to RJ, so that the fire department was the best position possible to save life and limb, and I think they did a great job. But I didn't think about calling you at that time, so that's definitely an area for improvement. Yeah, we've got some less. Let's keep moving. What more, more time are we, are we at? Uh, not time? your time yet. Yeah, we're not there. <laughs> not my time yet. What time are we at? Uh, the latest. I'm at 7:13. Okay, keep going. 7:13. Uh, Jason sent Ryan and Jacob home. Uh, Josh G called from SEOC at 7:40. See how we're doing. We aren't flooding yet. 8:08. Jacob and Huh? Jacob and Huh? Ryan. Ryan. Maybe also worth mentioning that, um, was it both Jacob and Ryan who took uh, vehicles home with them that night? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was a decision to have them. Would it ever occur to you, Jason, to bring vehicles to this side of the river? That's what I did. Yeah. Yeah. Brought them, yeah. I sent them home with the guys that lived on this side so we'd have stuff on both sides of the river. Yeah, yeah. okay. Wow. I have a note. At 8.35 about Hogback Road being closed, does that seem about right? Yeah. Uh, you have a select board meeting at 3.15? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. Uh, 8.54, uh, there was a call about a resident on Sinclair Road clearing ditches with their own tractor. I think I called you and asked to go up and look at that, and you said there wasn't anything to worry about or something. Uh, I had been actually right before that. I forgot about that. Right before that, um, <coughs> I happened to have been driving by to see the water levels um, on around Sinclair to check the bridge. Nine sixteen, you closed Hunter Road. Eleven thirty four. Uh, Gidget, Roger, and RJ came into the SEOC. You remember what we talked about? 
in my opinion, that would be when we were starting to realize that the information upstream was outpacing what we were seeing down here. We came in and talked a little bit about trying to make contact with some of our high hazard areas, um, just putting some boots on the ground to see what the reality was. At midnight, we called the guys, the fire department went on duty at midnight. The first hour, they just basically went around and identified status and um, hazards. So hazards for us would be propane, tank, <clears throat> propane tanks, um, uh, place accesses that are cut off, that type of thing. We learned about <clears throat> some of the stuff that Jason had already closed just in terms of mobility. Um, we only had about an hour of <clears throat> trying to sort of come up to speed before things really when did, group, when did Group 15 close? Uh, Jason called at 12.06 and said the Sheriff's Department was shutting Group 15 down. On uh, both sides or just one side? That was on the Jolly side, so I guess that would be the Easterly side. Okay. Oh, it's a, you oh, the west. municipal you building. West. west, that west. one, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's the East-West Road. <laughs> So they actually predicted the winter what the river heights going down at one point. Uh, Did we close Route 15 down on, on the east side eventually in the dip there by past the gravel pit? No, that was right. So Route 15 is closed in a lot of different areas for you know a seven mile stretch up in Wolka, obviously. Right. Then I was coming from Wolka around 50 miles an hour and just below the Mall of Union is a curve here coming this way. That had filled up with water and I hit that 50 miles an hour. Crap. And you know, That'll thought, teach you. No, I thought it left it. Mm. Like, um. it didn't stop. So anyways, we did not, um, we posted people up there that far up. Well, a crossing? Did it come over a little crossing? Yeah, yeah. we were a little crossing. <coughs> RJ, it was around 11.15 that you did your hazard checks, I believe, because at 11.15 I had posted on the website for people to check their own things. Sounds about right. I think we came in somewhere around 11 o'clock to your EOC. Kind of made a quick uh, quick plan of attack, and the guys arrived at midnight. Yeah. At 12.30 we had the following road closures. Lendway, River Road East. Um, past Waterman, Hogback Road, River Road, East, we just, the whole, that was listed twice. Uh, <coughs> there was a sinkhole at Hunter Road at 12.30. Still not in the lower mobile home park. Still not, and Route 15 was still open at that point. 1 a.m. is when Westcombe Road and Scribner Bridge were closed in my notes. It's got to be close to that time. Yeah. I think you're not, yes, when I call, I called with both of my calls, one and one I've checked on the other. Yeah. And then at 117, you closed Railroad Street. Uh, uh, at Route 15 between the municipal building and Jolly's has water over the road. The trans have not closed at 3.15 a.m. But it was like really over the road. Like we were surprised. I feel like that the trans had not closed. It really came up fast from from that point on. So Evan and I, I don't have this in these notes, but Evan and I went outside around two thirty ish, two fifteen, two thirty ish, just to see where the water was. We walked down toward the Sterling Market, and it was already flooded over the road. You know, very flooded over the road. Really bridge. You couldn't walk over it. Yeah. And I remember getting back from walking out there and going to the parking lot in the municipal building and the lower part of the parking lot was starting to flood, like up where the little driveway part is. But, the, or actually up a little bit further than that even. But the thing I told Evan, I said, this water is like lapping like three feet, like it's really lapping really far. It's coming up really fast. We have to check every 15 minutes. And then around 2.45-ish, Three o'clock, something like, something like that. We went out. I went out again. And I said, "Oh shit, we forgot." I went out, and the water was at the back 
tire of my van mm. in the closest parking lot spot. Um, right around that 2.30 area is when Eric called <coughs> somebody from the water and light crew. I don't know if it was Nate or Chan or uh, about getting a truck load. Yeah, I think you called Jeff. It was a little later than that, sorry. Getting this is around, this is after three. The water and the bucket truck was in the hospital. At 3.20, I posted that Willow Crossing was closed. I think it had closed earlier than that, though, and we were just figuring out that it was closed. Um, and at 3.36, I posted a message. If you see people moving and lights around your property, it may be the Johnson Fire Department. They will attempt to make contact with you as they are looking for fuel, electric, and other hazards. They are doing their best to keep everyone safe. Does RJ, does the fire department have a siren down there by the mobile home park? Is there something mounted on a pole down there? Or is it? No, there's not, but that's a really, that's a lesson learned thing that... I thought there was one down there at one time. No, we did. We have one at the fire And that's, we didn't, we didn't use it. Is there, is there a plan mm -hmm. to figure out a... You gotta, you gotta... Same thing, Hyde Park years ago after 9 11 wanted. They had us ring the siren and testing it every Wednesday. Mm -hmm. But there was no people didn't know what to do. We heard it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, so but you could have a code, you know, like three blasts is a flood, or, you know, and people, I know when I grew up in the town of Woodstock, the fire department did it once a month. And, you know, there was a code, and everybody got it with their phone book. Of course, people don't get phone books anymore, but, um, you know, we could send them out with water and light bills or something to, I, I heard, I had a lot, of, I was up at the shelter and I had a lot of people say to me, we didn't know until we got up and put my foot in the, in the water that, that there was water in the building. Um, so it seems to me that we, we could and should come up with some system. Yeah, we put on that pink note so we have it in the capture things to follow up on. You can steal marks. I can write. Yeah. Um, so at three... Well, we're at one. You're still at one? Okay. What do you have at one? Jason closed Westcombe Road, Scribner Ridge. 117, Jason closed Railroad Street. 119. Yeah, this is the first time he makes it in my notes, but 119, I talked to Brian Raleigh and Itis, and everything at the library is looking good at that point. Yeah. At what time? Uh, that was 119. It was all sandbagging. Um, I think I still fun. Sandbags actually ordered it in. Mm -hmm. Because we had the plywood and sand with the gasket material on the, the windows facing the river, and those all held well. But we stacked sandbags around the other two windows on the side where we didn't think the water, but we were stacking high enough just in case. And the sandbag fell over and broke the window and started letting water in. <laughs> if we'd have had plywood up on those other two, we would have lasted longer, hopefully. But, so it I wouldn't have. It wouldn't have. Yeah. At the end of the day, it wouldn't yeah. have done that anyway. I do have a note that the first people that went up to the shelter uh, without oh, sharing man. names was at 9.31 p.m. When I got there, there was somebody that was up there, and they, they said they'd They're been there, there until like, you know, since 10, 10 at night or something. Yeah. And they had a dog and they were in the car. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about them multiple times then. That's for another issue. Um, so, okay, what else? that timeline is when the alarm went off for the devices at the sewer treatment plant. Tell us about 1.2 million gallons of water coming in. Okay. Coming in. Around what time was that, Ken? Uh, we were at what, 1.32 o'clock? Yeah. Somewhere around that. Give or take an hour on that time. Sure at what time did they did you guys shut the power off? Oh crap! That wasn't until like nine o'clock the next day, the eight o'clock. Yeah, the next day. Yeah, because I got a picture at two forty-seven at Sterling Market, underwater with the lights on. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that 
right there. That's was all that water right infiltration, Ken? Yeah. What's that? Was all that water coming into the plant from the infiltration sewer um, manhole covers? No, probably from the pipe under the bridge under the street. Uh, That's our uh, 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 I'm sure some of it was manhole covers and stuff, but yeah, Sterling Market looks open for business. <laughs> Okay, so we are now at 2 o'clock. Anything else we got for 2 o'clock? That was quiet on our end of things. It's a quiet down here, really. Yeah, I remember, I remember us specifically talking about, like, the calls were in waves that day. You know, it was crazy busy in the morning. There was, like, maybe a two-hour lull. It was crazy busy. Then we had our select board meeting. It was crazy busy after that. There was a small lull. We got crazy busy in those small wall. I think the next big portion is that 2.45, 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, so I looked that up and we posted at 3.30, it was 3.45 that we left. That's when I went out and looked. Um, yep, because that's 3.36 is when I posted about the fire department having lights out and looking for hazards. Um, and I didn't post again until 4.09. And at that point, around 3.45, not 2.45, 3.45, is when I went in and said, we have to leave. Because if we don't leave now, we're not going to get out. So I packed up stuff, some stuff, computer, papers, drinks, that kind of stuff. Not the other and microwave mac and cheese. I did not grow up in that and cheese. But before you left, I called Rosemary, and the two of us frantically tried to get into that vault. Oh, yeah, yeah. That and thing is more secure it. than any vault in this country, because even if you have the code, you can't get into it. You just have to have special hands or something. I felt like we were in an escape room. We couldn't right. figure out the trick. It was Water. terrible. Huh? It's break-in proof. No. Um, you have to have light fingers. Uh, sure. Have really late um, fingers so to that, the point that Evan had to go get rosemary. Well, at that point, we split. Eric yeah. stayed behind and got some that computers up off the floor. I, I went up and got rosemary. Then we came back down, and just in leaving, coming back, water had come off. Rosemary opened the ball. Her and I, Eric left when I was coming in, right about with rosemary. Rosemary and I got as many books upstairs as we could. At a certain point, I said, if we don't leave now, we're probably not leaving, and I don't want to be stuck here with you, so let's go. And that's, he also moved the server and stuff? Eric picked up computers while I was going to get Rosemary. Uh, I don't know, the server and personal computers, whatever there was, he, he helped with some vulnerable stuff, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. And then I took Rosemary home. You and Eric were up here getting the mobile emergency operations center working. So I got up here, and when I got up here, that's when people started really showing I mean, up. Ropes. Yeah. So up. when people yes. really started showing up, that's when you were doing rescues at this point. So rescues were starting to happen, and people were starting to show up, and it was just a matter of like getting them in the door, figuring out what to do because they were so. Much, I mean, they were just drenched on top of being homeless. And on my way to get Rosemary, I called <coughs> Duncan and asked him to come up. You weren't very far behind me when I showed up. I called you at the same time. Yeah, at one point we talked about calling both of them. I think it was at four. I think it was when you were coming back from bringing Rosemary home, you called me, and we talked about calling Eric and Duncan. How long does that seem? Four o'clock seems about right. If it wasn't four o'clock, it was four It was earlier. There well, wasn't, not by much. There wasn't sun up. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was still dark, but yes. I, I remember getting a phone call and saying, what the hell is he calling me at this hour and night for? Right. <laughs> you remember when I called you? Or Beth might have called you. I, might have, I, might have, I, I think know. we called. It was right around four that we called. Yeah, I think yeah. we called. 
Yeah. Yeah. I was late getting there. back yeah. to the shelter. And it was chaos. It oh was my God. chaotic. Mm -hmm. oh, we were up at the shelter. We were trying to arrange the college to assist the sheriff department with transfers. We were running out of beds really quickly. We ran out of beds. Really quickly. People were showing up with their pets, and we had to make a plan for pets. And that's something that we could anticipate, perhaps, in a new plan. Yeah. And did people end up in some of the dorm rooms? What'd you say, Mark? Did people end up in some of the dorm rooms? People with pets stay in the dorm That was a little later. Temporarily. But that was a little bit later, but yeah. Um, we did in the morning when it was a little late. Around seven, eight, something like that. It was during the course of that day. I think it was after breakfast that the college came up with basically a plan to, you know. Because people kept showing up. Yeah, people kept showing up, and more and more people showed up with pets. So the college did, I thought, a really good thing. They said, let's take uh, people that have children and pets and put them in dorm rooms, and then have some privacy, and that left, you know, people. In the main gym. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of events, those rescues, moving people, getting them into shelter, like we didn't, I don't think we tracked anything. Like I updated a few things on the website, but mostly it was just like reacting. all hands on deck and reacting. Um, on around seven, I ended up calling, maybe even six actually, I ended up calling um, my mother Linda and talking to Evan about getting towels. Like we didn't have towels, we didn't have clothes for people who you had me get towels. You had blankets or bed linens. Oh, so. Rosemary, that was earlier. Yeah, I called around asking for bed I linens. Said, people are showing up soaking wet. Some of them don't even have socks on. They literally had I went home yeah. and just dumped my sock drawer in a bag and dumped all our towels in a bag and ran back here. They're I think yeah. I tossed them at you or something. Or it was maybe it was blankets and sleeping yeah, bags. Yeah, you and brought stuff. blankets, sleeping bags. In the end, who was moving the people up here? Was it? it was a combination of the sheriff's department, the fire department, the road crew, the and college. the college yeah. had a van yeah, we had that a, they were shuttling. An employee, <laughs> that's our employee, part time that works here at the college, she said, What can we do at Elf? I said, We got vans. And we checked it out with the college, and I think they had two vans running first. Yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah, which was huge. It was very helpful. Do you know at what time? Because a fair amount of people lost their motor vehicles. You know, uh, even if they wanted to come here. Yeah, right. There were a lot of people that showed up wet up to here with nothing else. Oh, they were wet all over too. There, mm -hmm. there were people that were just drenched head to toe. Yeah. They walked up there from the from the hill. Do you know yes. about what time? Um, you and the water and light department started helping the fire department with rescues? Uh, the water and light department was busy for the first half of the morning. Uh, they started they started helping us, it was probably uh, 9.30 when yeah. they started helping. They were busy in the morning moving people stuff in the Did the fire department need assistance with the motor other than that? Yeah, we did uh, rescue off River Road West. Uh, the boat couldn't get, I guess, because the water was moving pretty good, and that was like Ish. Four light. Was it, light? it was light, it just was barely. Good. Just yeah. barely. Yeah. Yeah. Just barely because people started showing up. Yeah, I watched that happen. Yeah. So just to give a water level again on that, at um, 5:01 a.m. that morning, that's like cool Seven, in Colorado, so the water was. Approximately three feet from the day. And where was this that? Was was that two story the two-story apartment building behind the old ambulance building. Yeah, we were yeah. still working on the yeah. street. Yeah. So we, where, where were the bulk of the rescues happening? Railroad Street? 514. The mobile home park? It's the time I was down on that. So I got the picture right here. Uh, we're just so everybody knows we're at a public well, meeting. So we just need to make sure that one, hey, Jason, we just need to make sure that one person is talking at a time. Um, and I like that everyone's like engaging. That's awesome. Uh, so, Ken, you were kicking us off. What were you saying? So at 501, the water by the old ambulance building on Railroad Street was approximately three, three and a half feet deep. <coughs> at 
727 one of the same cars, so it must have rose another couple feet, two and a half to three feet. And I would say that, that would be about the crest time. This was from my daughter, of course, we have this. Seven, uh, we can look at the crest time. Yeah, yeah. Is that the roof of the car? Yeah. yeah. So West Cambridge, we posted that West Cambridge was closed at 5.01. And Scribner Bridge closed around the same time. I think that's earlier in the July event. West Cambridge? I think you mean Railroad Street. Bridge. No, I don't. I think I added Scripner late. It's less than relevant Scripner Bridge. What if the rain stopped? So hold on one second before we get to that. Friday? A week later. <laughs> yes, yeah, so yeah. it's, uh, it's still raining. It's still raining. Uh, at 5.15, Railroad Street was closed, which is pretty late considering all that we're talking about. And 630, 624 is when we posted the River Road West. Railroad Street. Railroad Street had to be a lot different. Yeah. I don't know why it was updated then. Okay. I'm going to say it was around 5.45 is when we were down doing Railroad Street on uh, West Road. Because we got, I got the pictures here. When we okay. were down there. When you were at West Island, the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Island well. yeah, right there is West yeah. Island. So will you put people in the bucket in the loader? Yeah, there's a picture of Arthur in the bucket. With, with, is, it, is he standing there with Ryan? Uh, yeah, then we had uh, two firefighters in the bucket too, with them, stabilizing people. <laughs> Hanging on for dear life. And that water was deep on that. The loader tires were three quarters underwater, weren't they? Yeah, down there there was a few times when we just seen the top of them. Uh, it came up, it was still coming up when we were down doing the rescues, but it, it seemed to go down almost as fast as it came up. It's during, you know, that morning it was dropping pretty fast for how high it came up, I thought, anyway. Did you have to change the water in your, or the oil in your differential? Yeah, we went through and that, that morning we changed the oil and the transmission. And then uh, that uh, Friday we did all the oil changes in the whole machine. And then at 11.30 we turned the electric. We posted that the electric was getting turned off. At 11.30 a.m. Yeah. on Tuesday morning. Seems about right. They, they shut, the village shut the power down. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not the entire village. It was. Um, it was only it was one, one of their lines. One so side, circuit, right? One line. Yeah, yeah. So I remember the um, side of town was still on. The other thing is that we opened the e EOC at 5 a.m. here. We're never going to get through the first 48 one. And the community center is also the. 1238 gave yeah. up. Yeah. It, was, it was right down the hall, like the next room. Is there any benefit to a facility closer to the flood prone areas for, for both the shelter and the main center? Or is, does the distance not really affect the process? Well, everything closer floods, like our whole village flooded pretty much. The elementary school is the other shelter. Um, for people without cars, yeah, it would be huge, but there's nothing yeah, I mean, just available, really. Nothing big enough. To if the municipal building didn't flood, that would have been a good spot. For the yeah, EOC? For the EOC, right. Yeah. yeah. If, if the guy on floods, like an ice jam or something, you know, you'd have problems leading up to the elementary school. My experience in emergencies is you don't want to have your EOC right on top of the incident. So I, I, I thought, you know, from outside looking in, that this worked perfectly. Awesome. And one of the reasons it did was because college was out of session. Right. And had college been in session, it would have been much, yeah. Yeah. much higher left. I actually had that as one of my good old basketball games. Game Is there any town or village official that has control of some part of the college? Does in order for a command center to take place, do you need an outside entity's permission to set up? 
And like, is there some contract that could be arranged to like have it always available in the event of like if like you uh, Evan had to be on the phone, you know, two hours before the shelter opened, you had you know, it took you two hours to get confirmation to set up the shelter, and then like is there is there some like does that make any sense? Yeah, I think the college has a MOU with the American Red Cross, right? Oh, got it, got it. But the, the idea is that we set up an emergency shelter right off, and then within so many hours, the Red Cross is contracted to take it over, right? That's. I don't know. I didn't know that. Huh. Didn't know that would have been nice to know. I know. Well, right? that's what Sarah Trumbull, was it Sarah Trumbull? Oh, uh, yeah. Trumbull. Trumbull, she, um, she made us aware of that, because the Red Cross wasn't coming until she got on the phone. She said, oh, no, you're coming. <laughs> I've got it. I've got it in paper. I'm writing right yeah. here. You're coming. So it sounds like those are already in place. It's just putting it all together. We need to be more. But that was a hole. Yeah. That was a hole because you guys couldn't. You couldn't reach anybody. You couldn't get tried. anybody to respond. <laughs> yeah. From the Red Cross. Some uniqueness so about this one was yeah, like the right. wideness in the state that you know. Yeah. I mean, Red Cross was down. In Ludlow, yeah, and, in Montpelier, you know, Barry, Montpelier, Barry, Barry. and they were just stretched incredibly thin. I think Do we, multiple other parties. They were going to send our dislocated people down to White River Junction or something. Yeah, well, sure. yeah. yeah, they went and got, they went and got. Yeah. But anyway, we should have to. Do we, do we know um, about the cell towers at the college and yeah, on the hill? Right. Are they all? I'm just, I, are they all backed up with generators? Is the one at the college backed up with generators? The cell towers? Right on your because paper, we'll follow up on it. If we shut down Village Electric, which shuts down the college, which shuts down the cell towers, then we could isolate this area. That's I, I know they could, but... You know. The college is on a completely separate circuit. I, I totally understand that. But, but you're still, still saying, what, nice what, if know, what if something happens? What if something happens? Can you, can, can you write it down on your sticky? I got it. I can. Oh, no, no, no. Let him write it. He knows how to write. <laughs> well, I'm going to be curious, Roger. I think you, you should be able to answer that. Is the South okay, Mark, are you writing it? Writing it? Backed up a generation? Okay. That's a good question. I should follow up on it. What time? Okay, we're at. What time are we at? Well, we're, we got a little ahead of ourselves. Do so we want to say something about it? Is there a total number of um, people that came to the shelter? Is that recorded? I don't know what the total number is. The highest was around 28 people, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we were just shy of 30 at our at a point in time with the highest number of people there. But we had people coming and going. Uh, like you talk about total people, it's definitely over there. What's the name of the note? Yeah, having, having that number in the background. What's the name of the note? It's a list. Okay. What are you going to say now? It's an area for improvement. Is that yeah. We had a checking list that we weren't really keeping track of. We can't meet it because people's writing was illegible. So we definitely need in the future intake forms that list things like, are you diabetic and do you have your medication? <laughs> Yeah. Things that we were like, holy smokes, like yeah. in the pharmacy. Yeah, diabetic is a thing around this time I called NEMS. Yeah, we got called at one point because there was someone that just needed lancets. So we came up and we just went in our stock room and grabbed boxes and we came up and as we were handing people lancets, somebody else came and said, Apologies, we have all the stuff here. Lancet? Oh, it's just to stick your finger to get the blood sample okay. for your glucometer. Sorry. So as we brought them up, somebody within the shelter said, oh, no, we have all this. It's all over here. But, like, the people that were in the shelter weren't aware of that. Um, yeah. So we got called for a few just, like, medical supply things. Um, what was, was that, Vicki? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I could easily find that information I out. I thought there was a diabetic person that didn't have their medication. Yeah. There was. Yes, there was another patient that later on in the day we came and transported somebody who didn't have their medications. Yeah. Yeah. But other people had like mental health medications that they weren't getting, and people, they didn't even know what they were supposed to be taking. I mean, there was one time we got called to bring someone Tylenol, uh, because they took Tylenol every night for their back pain, and so we were familiar with the patient, so I just grabbed Tylenol from my house, and we came up with ambulance and, and brought them Tylenol, so there was a lot of little things like that.
Um, at 5.30, the college puts in their notes that we were starting to ask about food and what we're going to do to feed people. And they started figuring out a plan to feed people. And by the way, this is one of those notes. We have to have water with us. Can you that pink pad? We have to have water with us. The only reason that like, I had a, happened to have a uh, thing of a case of water in my car and gave it to people as they come in. But like we nobody was prepared with water at the very during the emergency. Afterward, we had like tons and tons of water. But during the emergency we didn't have any. Yeah, I've got that here pre-staging certain things, pots, MRE, water. Sounds like that should be the conversation between the Red Cross and the college, right? Because if this is the EOC, it needs to be stationed here. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but, but the... Well, this isn't the EOC today. What, what ended up happening in this case was Red Cross wasn't able to respond for, what, two and a half, three days? They didn't come until 5 p.m. on Wednesday. Yeah, so we were, the town was basically on our own. Now, that situation has never happened that I know of. It's happened. Well, I haven't that long. But in the 19th flood, we had people at the municipal building yeah, the Red Cross took for a long until time. we got them up yeah, here. Right? Maybe it took a day. Right? They couldn't. They Red Cross wasn't able to come. I guess the point is, we to to Roger's point, we should think about staging some blankets or cots or you know because we were we were hurting. I you know what? First day. I mean, well, I don't think we need to do it. We need to make sure the college is doing it. If they're the shelter, then we need them. We need their help with doing it. It's not your. Like, I don't, that's not your responsibility, right? That's well, the emergency management plan. I have a big responsibility plan. for the whole county. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Do you know at what point the fire station evacuated itself? <clears throat> no, I... I like, know it's when I was going down with Rosemary. Yeah, I, I didn't bring our run sheets. The same thing Roger said earlier. I wasn't really prepared for times. It was more of the events. It was uh, approximately 6, 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. I got it. Yeah, say, because we get done evacuating uh, Westcombe Road, and you, you were sending a crew uh, back over there to evac the fire van from Gould. Right, yeah. Because uh, that's the time I was taking pictures as I left, because we went down and did the help NEMS across uh, by the forget me not. Yep. For Didn't the they have a rescue call out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But before that, you guys had staged all your miracles on Gold Hill. Like that was at like well when I left around three thirty ish. <clears throat> right. So you alluded to the water coming in the back parking lot, something that had never happened before. We moved all the first responder vehicles. We moved all the vehicles that weren't assigned to rescues up onto Gould Hill, and then. It was just a matter of time before I entered the building. And you're prepared to do remote communications in one of your vehicles, aren't you, if you need to? Yeah, so we did a uh, little more than half of our operations were after we evacuated the building. So it was out of a remote operating, you know, the operations were ha basically happening out of my pickup. And then all of the deployments and the team assignments where there was multiple operations happening at the same time. We started out cataloging everything at the dispatch office in our station until we had to leave, and then we did everything remote. So everything was mobile at that point in time. And that went smoothly? Uh, we, we had trouble keeping track of the timestamps for when not so much when we started an event, but when we stopped an event and moved to the next one. We've got really good records while we had the office man, but when we were working out of the rigs, it's a little bit more fragmented. Where does your dispatch come from? Sheriff. Sure. I was coming probably from multiple places that night. Mm. There were people that were calling what are we calling it? The emergency operations line, which was your cell phone? That was my cell phone, yeah. There were people that were calling us and saying we needed to be rescued, and I was calling RJ. There was a couple of calls that I made to Craig. Um, I 
forgot to say that. That's actually, all that happened the beginning with the municipal phone until we left and then we switched yeah. over to my cell phone. That was between that like 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. window. Right, which, I mean, uh, you're working on a timeline tonight if you want areas for improvement. That was one thing that was super hard to keep track of, right? Because our primary dispatch comes from the sheriff's office. And then the second party calls, all that stuff working in is cumbersome. It's, it's not going through the dispatch log, right? So right. Um, that's one thing that was overwhelming, you know. I, I had 107 phone calls on my personal phone that night. Mm. And um, it's just, I wasn't able to manage them all. Uh, just no way. And I didn't even count the texts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we did encourage people to call 911. I think it was just out of abundance of but that's sure a, everybody was taken care of. But that's a good point. So we should probably make sure that we, through emergency management, are going through dispatch. Or, uh, or in my opinion, set up a, a second method, a second channel that we're all familiar with, a, a second method to operate a second line of communications. Dispatch is overwhelmed too. I mean, let's face it, I, you wouldn't want to be sitting up there. They had their hands full, right? And yeah. so the more signals and the more chaos it gets put out there, the more 911 rings, and that's overwhelming too. So maybe having a local secondary method of communication or a method of dispatch is, is a proper idea. But we need to figure out how to establish that. Yeah, I got it. So pre-plan a single line of communication. What we ended up, a takeaway from us, and what we did is now we have a dedicated cell phone up at the mall for emergencies. Maybe you want to do the same thing and, it's, and assign a volunteer uh, to answer that phone. And, and how, would pe how do people know that cell phone number? Well, this would be, well, for us, it's going to be for, uh, you know, we're going to have to, to train everybody, our emergency services. So it's going to be your people that are going to know right now. But for the town, you know, I'd recommend this highly, is one of my needs for discussion here is this, uh, Johnson Citizen Volunteers. If people want to volunteer during an emergency, you can have somebody just assigned to answer that, that cell phone, which you have, You'll have plenty of time to get that number out to people in the event of an emergency. You call this number, and it doesn't matter if you're flooded out of the uh, municipal building or not. You know, that'll be your emergency number. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got it as a takeaway. So you should keep going. Yeah. So, as, do RJ and the highway share radios? Like, could you guys talk on the same line? Like we can switch over to their channel. We try not to interfere with, but we got each other's cell phones. How we were communicating during the, this between either me or RJ or me and Craig. And then at the municipal building, is there a radio that we can communicate? There's a radio that can communicate with myself, or they can switch the channel and communicate with. So is like a third channel during an emergency event worthwhile, or is that too over the top? Or the four channels on the radio. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel it might be a little overwhelming because the village has a chance. I mean, and just thinking about an emergency event, you have, how does it? So we have a cell phone. We call the cell phone. How does a person manning the cell phone communicate with first responders? And yeah, and I think that it's all good points. I I think we're not going to solve it right now, yeah. but we need to have a communication plan. There is sure. that mobile CV you could call it. Um, I have all the pre program like still fire department more so the quality on that thing I found to be so terrible I, I couldn't <coughs> use it. Um, okay. Oh. Okay. Good point. Plan. Yep, that's one of the things like that's definitely one of the follow ups. Um, the college says at approximately six forty five AM they got approval to move people to senators. At approximately 7.45, they received notice of the town was shutting off power. We already covered that. Um, 
at approximately 9 a.m. we got word that the sheriff's department was requesting boats for evacuating people as the water was still on the rise at 9 a.m. Um, and they began gathering spare boats to land for evacuation. And where were they evacuating people with boats? Burrow Street, pretty much. Because the bucket loader was not an option then. Burrow mm -hmm. Street was too high. At that point, when they were using them for that section of Railroad Street by the library and down this way uh, towards, I guess, Operly's place, they were using boats because it was too high for us to get any farther with the loader without submerging it until later on when it went down enough where we went through it. Shelter. Yeah, again, uh, you know, I think the thing that we were struggling with, Eric mentioned several times that there were people that had mental health needs that were just not being addressed. Um, and then, you know, the basic stuff like, you know, blankets and diapers. Oh, yes, yeah, uh, really basic, really basic stuff like that. And your, you know, your mom and that crew was just super with the help that they, you know, they came up with. That was a response, that was a reaction to a need. Yep. And we should try and pre-plan some of that stuff if we can. I think that mental health issue and, and social service issue, generally speaking, we need to think about and planning going forward because that was definitely very traumatic for everybody, and I would argue for us too. Uh, and <coughs> we were reaching out to local county services to help come in, and they did. Um, they came in later on Tuesday, I think is when we first started engaging with them. But I think that going forward, but they're impacted too. Yeah, they were impacted. So they're impacted too, so we're relying on people in our community to provide these services who are also being impacted. And they can't get here, because uh, there's no way to get into town. Um, well, there, I mean, there are some ways, but it's not easy. But those, and I was talking to somebody at the United Way today, too, about this particular event. And they're learning a lot of lessons and doing, having these same meetings among themselves. So I think lessons are learned on both sides there. They, they know that there's a gap there. And yeah, so what I was frustrated with is they did not have an emergency response team. Right. Like if there's a shooting at a school, they got a team of mental health people that were going to the school and deal with kids and parents and whomever. But I was trying for the most part of the day to get a hold of somebody. And uh, I finally had to get uh, Dan Noyce to use his resources and then I got some action, but just nobody would respond. And they still didn't come Tuesday. It was the next day before they missed it. Wednesday, yeah, we started talking to people Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, it was Wednesday. So there was people who were there here, yeah. Were dealing with mental health issues to begin with that were affected, and uh, they were requesting their mental health counselors. And yeah. And then we have people who were just in shock who hadn't previously had mental health issues, but they clearly were not functioning properly. Yeah. And we're still dealing with 
with some of those people. I was going to say that's the biggest thing for NIMS. There's one patient in particular we still go to sometimes up to three times a day. The only reason why we're not responding to that person now is because he finally became ill with sepsis and he's in the hospital. Um, and there's just no help for him. We've done everything. We've had crews that have literally gone down and helped him go through his trailer, which had apparently four feet of water in it, and we're going through moldy clothes to help get him clothed. Um, sometimes we take him out for lunch. Um, there's just, there just doesn't seem to be any help for kind of like the vulnerable population in Johnson to help him recover. And people think it's over, and it, it's not. I mean, this patient in particular is just, he keeps going back to his home even though it's not there. The Red Cross gave him two checks, and he doesn't understand what to do with them, so he accidentally threw them away. But he doesn't even have the capacity to understand that these checks, you know, like, I think, and I don't know, but from listening to everyone, I think he got the checks to buy him out of his mobile homes, but he doesn't understand that. So he thinks, well, if I cash these checks, my buddies will help me get food. He doesn't understand that he can't go back into the home. So, like, we get called because he's breaking in the locks because they try to lock. So it's just, like... There's no support for the vulnerable population around here after this happened or even during. And I don't know, like, there's probably a lot more to it that we don't see or understand that's going on to try to help some of these people. But even leading up to it, there's one person that we go to often, and we, we said to this person, you're going to have to leave, but they didn't understand. Like, some people just don't have the capacity to understand or make these decisions. So is there something we can do? So next time something like that, we know like who to go to and send extra help to those folks that can't make these decisions on their own, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, one thing I think we did do that we did well, I'm skipping ahead a little bit because we're talking about it, but on Wednesday, we got together the different service groups. We were basically prepared to do a handover to the American Red Cross and also make sure that we had all of the different health services and well-being services in a room together to talk about case management and make sure that people who were in the shelter had somebody assigned to them, like that person was their responsibility. Like, I think we did that well, and it, would, it did come down to that whole, like, us really throwing a little bit of a stamping our feet and saying we need people here um, so to that's, get them. Yeah. That's where I have notes on. Um, on, on, that, on Wednesday morning, I went around to do a survey of all the residents to get names, addresses, medical conditions, that sort of thing, so that we could hand it over. And these were the people that were up here at this? Okay. okay. You know, whatever animals they had. Somebody had a box of guinea pigs, I think. Is that, yeah, that was... So, um, yeah, then Wednesday, <coughs> 210 North Carolina Search and Rescue showed up. Um, and then on that Wednesday at 6 p.m., all of the, we met with all of the services. We ended up in the Little County, the uh, Little Community House Capstone. I think that the, the by that time there were two women from the Red Cross that were here. And then at 7 p.m., the Red Cross came with their trailers. On Wednesday. That's right. At yeah. any point, did um, we have to? basically forcibly say, you got to get out of here. People that want to stay in their home say, I'm going to ride this out. Were there places where you folks or your folks said, no, you're not, and you... <laughs> At what point were the... But you, can re you had to really encourage people to... The message was, this is your last opportunity. We are not coming back for you. And did, did people in your mind stay in their homes that shouldn't have? In the, early, in the early warning stuff, we went around to most everybody that on Railroad Street in our vulnerable areas and contacted them, and they all said, we're going to be fine. And they were the ones that made multiple calls to 911 to get out and were so pissed that we didn't get them out first. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that awesome. attitude is a super difficult one. And when you get to places and people don't want to leave, we're pretty reasonable the first time, maybe the second time. <clears throat> but in the height of this, when we were going back for the 
second and third time, it was very clear that this was their one opportunity. Okay. Yeah, because I'm hearing from people like Beth, you're saying, the people that got out of bed and put their feet on the ground and there was water and they were just stunned. Yeah. You know, because they clearly had not paid attention to our first responders. But, and well, you're also dealing with a lot of those mental health issues. Well, the one in particular that I know of, and, and, and this person said to me, fire department came and said I had to get out, but I didn't understand why. It's never flooded here before. And then he called, and we tried to respond to him, and we couldn't get to him. And then you guys, he said, came with a kayak and a bucket loader to get him out. He just doesn't have the ability to understand and make those decisions. So I don't know if there's any way in the future to kind of know where those people are and send someone they're familiar with or just have a better plan to help kind of the vulnerable people get out. Um, because that person was hugely traumatized and we responded to him several times throughout the days after and just... I think you know, there are a lot of people who needlessly lost their motor vehicles. You know, so to your point, Vicki, before you go to the vehicle thing, to your point, we need somebody up front in the planning, we need somebody during the emergency, and then we need people after the emergency for support. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there was a few people, and this the same person we went to several times at the shelter, uh, this person's elderly, they, they can't lay flat on a cot. So the first night this person tried to stay at the shelter, it just didn't work. So then they tried to find a chair because that's what the person was used to. And then they got, you know, we were going every day to the shelter, transporting the Copley. Copley would send the person back. And we went back and forth like that for days or weeks after with, you know, one or two or three people that just needed a little bit more support. Um, so I don't know if there's a way to kind of identify those people and plan for it in the future. Yeah, I think that's possible part of that social planning because those folks already have case workers and they need their case workers. And some of that gets into, you know, we have the health privacy concerns and we can't get yeah, all that. We right. can't know the people, but we can ask the social worker people to have a plan for addressing the people that they know live in those floodplains. I think we can do that. Right. They can be part of those Sunday, Monday calls, like this is happening. We are going to need you. But they can we work in 8 to 5. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and they showed up. They knew everybody who was here. Not everybody, but they knew a lot. It is hard. I think I think some people just like the one person in particular that we're still responding to daily. It's hard to help some people, right? This person could come to the shelter, but just chooses to keep going back to where they think home is. They probably shouldn't be living alone either. Right. Yeah, and there's nothing we can do about it. Right. Yeah, and as, as a person that was there, and I know who you're talking about, um, and Erica backed me up, I think, um, we, we bent over backwards to try and accommodate the needs of some of those people. Um, and there's, there's a limit to what, what yep. you can do yep. in those circumstances. It's just like the one that we're still responding to. I think there's probably a good amount of it. It's just some people, unfortunately, you can't help. There's, we're all guessing that there's probably a lot of services being thrown at this individual, but it's just how do you, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky situation. It's, it's hard for us to go and, and, and find this person sleeping on a pile of moldy clothes with nothing on and in just horrible conditions you wouldn't want anyone to live in, but the other side of this too is, you know, how do you help those people? There's some people you probably can't help, I don't know. Um, we have a gap between 11.30 Tuesday and Wednesday morning. Nothing happened. <laughs> that is definitely not true. <laughs> <'cause I can't laughs> when did the water peak first back? Wait, it peaked on Tuesday, Wednesday? What? Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday, Thursday. Yeah, midday tonight. No, it was, uh... It was, it was peaked by then, probably, but we couldn't go through it with a loader. I think until on it Tuesday, down. we met with the Rubicon team. Uh, between you, myself, and Sarah and Matt, we probably tried to spend eight or ten hours on the phone to get Red right Cross here. So, yeah, that was managed the shelter. That was a <coughs> massive amount of Just pops out of an idea. 
when locally when you get stuck like that and you're not going to respond, sometimes it's good just to get on the SEOC and put in a ticket. You can you speak I, up? Well, I think I have she 10 to 15 tickets. Just, usually that shakes the tree a little harder. Just for the Red Cross, I had like 10 15 tickets. Honestly, Scott, the, honestly, the state emergency team, like it felt like they were two, like, two days behind us. The whole time. Okay. So if we're talking Tuesday, like they were still setting up, they weren't really helping at that point. Well, I mean, in fairness, they had, you know, they had to respond statewide. I mean, we were by far, yes. you know, not the only community that was dealing with this. That's stuff. exactly right. It was the lesson that we learned. We learned during Irene yep. that look, each community has to be self-sufficient for a couple of days, maybe two days. So all of this stuff we've got to figure out because we could never get the state police if we needed help doing Irene. Yeah. They were overwhelmed doing other things. So that's yeah. a real thing. A pleasure. Yeah. Um, that uh, we've got to plan for that as best we can. I can give you what we were doing. Go for it. So at 10 o'clock, I sent the guys around through Morseville with the greater of the back road on Upper French to go on this side of town to get all the roads that were affected graded. And then, because we couldn't do anything with the roads that still had water on them. They had that all wrapped up around four o'clock as far as everything we could do besides the two roads that were impacted the greatest and that was River Road East and Lenway Lane. At uh, 2.47, we, the water was down and we went and fixed the Westcombe Road section of the two driveways that were affected and then at 535 they were cleaning up the back of the library with all the sand and debris that was around it that was when Tuesday Tuesday so you had brought the greater over to this side of the river And then we worked until 8.30 that night, and we picked up the signs and stuff and opened the roads back up that could be opened. And there was still water on some of the roads at that point, I think, right? Lenway Lane was the last one to go down as far as uh, in uh, River Road uh, East, but we couldn't open them because of the damage. And the hog back road. The hog back was open back. Uh, we just, open back yeah, back. they were down there around s between 6.30 to 7.30, scraping it and getting it all cleaned off, the silt and stuff with the loader and the backhoe. Um, by 7, we had all the lines recharged. And I think we had 50 customers that was on the So we were already there. So Eric said, this all seems after I had to go deal with the water treatment facility and electric department. Um, I'd like to get this in. I think the EOC needs a pad of watch officer log forms and a list of what to do, bring if there's a need to jump to the EOC. Yep, I agree. To jump the EOC, essentially, like if the EOC is flooded again. Good adjustments made already. The municipal office is all laptops and can move ops much more easily if needed. Cool. You want me to go to Wednesday morning for us or wait? Uh, is there anything else that anyone has for Tuesday? Um, when, when did um, Route 15 open back up? Mm -hmm. I mean, when did Johnson become accessible? <coughs> Afternoon, uh, afternoon off day. Sure. Uh, like nothing will cut after I left here to go up there. You know, they had some serious damage. But, you know, one way Okay. As far as through our town, we were able to go down through at 247 to Westcombe Road and stuff like that to take stock of what we were going to have to do. So okay. I think this, they were still, still on the right. Riverside Lane. And they were everybody was using all utilizing and the upper crossing to your to your knowledge was open. I'm no. not sure about that. No, no. because um, 
we went down through with the folks from North Carolina, the water rescue teams, mm -hmm. and it was around 315, 330 when we were on Westcombe Road, yeah. um, checking East Highland again. And then we went down and checked uh, a residence down off of Willow Crossing, and water was still over the road there. So Willow closed. Crossing was closed till Tuesday night by the state V trans. Right. Late afternoon. And high back probably was closed. Um, um, mid at midnight on Wednesday. Wednesday. So, midnight was, at twelve oh one Wednesday. Railroad yeah. Street was open. Main Street to the municipal building was open. River Road West was open. And Route 15 between Municipal and Jollies was still closed. So I was up here, I got a call from Jason at 10, 10 o'clock that Hogback was clear. On Wednesday, 10 a.m.? Yeah. Tuesday night. Yeah, Tuesday night we had it all opened up. Hogback. I don't know, Hogback. I mean, I'm just yeah, curious. Tuesday, Tuesday night. Oh, maybe that was Tuesday night. That is Tuesday. This is Tuesday, Tuesday night. Tuesday night is when you and I went home. That's right. And Nat uh, took care of everything through the night. And I know Hogback was open because I couldn't shut my mind off when I went down and had Jason show me all the fuck in. I remember going home. I remember sleeping. Okay. Um, I think we're trying to sleep. I do remember I hung out to say that. So Nat was answering the phones all Tuesday night through the night? Um, we took six hour shifts, uh, four hour shifts. Four hours, except Evan didn't quite take four. It was more like six. <laughs> 8 p.m. To, to midnight, and then that came in. Midnight, midnight to six. Four to six, four to six, to six hours six. left. Yeah. Yeah. And, you guys <laughs> would get, you got, and you were getting calls pretty much throughout the night, were you? I got a handful. Yeah. The, my, the phone was always ringing. Like, there was never a t period of time where, I mean, it was quiet for like an hour or two sometimes, but it was almost always ringing. I had to leave it. I didn't have a personal phone. Would you say most of the calls were from Johnson residents, or were they from aid? They're from everywhere. They were from everywhere. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were from everywhere. Yeah, there were Johnson residents. It was the state checking. It was... Media. Media. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was just everywhere. Um, I have this note at July 12th at, what is 14? What is 2 p.m. 2 p.m. <laughs> that Johnson is now below flood stage. And I remember watching because it was going down. <laughs> going down, it was almost there. And I'm like, I'm going to post this the second it goes below flood. But the water had already received flood stage, meaning less than 13, 13 below, like 14 feet. Yeah. Fourteen is like minor. Okay, Johnson Hogback Johnson side was open, but not the whole Hogback. I think that was the difference, by the way. Because at 206, I there's an update that Johnson side only is open. That's right. Cambridge could well still be underwater. Yeah. Some, some sections. Okay. Um, <coughs> anything else of urgency to get in the timeline for Tuesday? If people think of things down the road, we can add it later too. In the the world. Wednesday's the first 48. We're good. Wednesday. Let's get to let's get to 2 p.m. on Wednesday. That's when we had that meeting. What meeting? The health care people meeting. And Wednesday was the oh. first day we started calling around for debris management. I don't want to talk about dumpsters. debris management ever again for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and I didn't even do the bulk of it. I know. Uh, I don't know by any means. <laughs> That's a takeaway, though, that we need, a emergency, we need to bake into our emergency management plan so something we, about debris management. We need, we need to pay contract? somebody five hundred dollars an hour just to take the phone calls and arrange everything. Oh, it's done. Just three stages. <laughs> Why did I mean, I'd rather do the phone calls. The volunteers, you guys did it for free. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the Johnson's getting an intern from UVM uh, for forty hours ish, and their main focus will be a debris plan, uh, management plan in the event of a flood. 
So their whole focus of this internship will be developing a FEMA approved, so for full reimbursement, this um, debris management plan. So that is going to be, for, we'll have that in the next couple of months. I'd like to talk about that. Yeah, that's Friday at 10. The plan is to develop a FEMA reimbursement. I mean, FEMA already has all the sheets. We've seen them a hundred times. Develop a, probably a plan well, for us. Develop yeah, a plan for us. For us. So we know yeah. that so that is FEMA reimbursement. One of the concerns we keep hearing from residents is that people who took initiative in those first hours and cleaned up are not eligible for reimbursement. Okay. That's, that's hard for all of us to hear as well, right? Is that they, People who took care of themselves and their neighbors are not helpful for reimbursement. And um, so how we need to step it up with plans so that all residents can be eligible for reimbursement. And that's kind of what this plan is, is instead of like kind of scrambling, we'll have a checklist to pick up a phone and make an email and then allow, have access for everybody. You guys get a lot more work next time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if, if we plan ahead, we can pre-stage dumpsters and stuff in places that we know they're going to be dry, but also FEMA, you know. If you want to, exactly. like, most smartly plan ahead, just be lazy and wait for the state to come in and do all of it. Or you don't have to do any of the work. You don't have to do any reimbursement. That would be the right. most foolproof plan. If the state like some declare, of our neighbors did. If the state doesn't declare a state of emergency, and you have part of pre-bottle stuff. Then you have taxpayers breathing down your throat on the other side. <laughs> yeah, so you get it, get it. There's a lot to consider, but that, that's a good thing that's happening. But yeah. yeah, I'm not sure the details yet, but it's to be true. Jason, what time do you think that all roads were open? All roads were open by 4 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. Okay. Meaning the state road, Route 15, was open. I, I know where I'm He works on town roads, that's it. But if there's nobody coming. But it was. It was by Wednesday. Yeah, by Wednesday that was River Road East and West, or uh, one way were all fixed back up and done. So. Uh, Eric dropped, unfortunately, when I just saw something that, uh, oops. And that, that was just popped up, and that is that, um, for the electric, for the electric stuff, um, we had given Nate's cell phone number at one point, like we've been asked to give out his number at one point. So I think on that same communication plan, like figuring out what the right way for people well, to Well, technically the village does have a phone. Um, we had Troy's old phone sitting around, and mm -hmm. once I jumped on to help with DLC and Eric went back with the guy, the crew to get the power on, we had to put that number on yeah. so you take Nate's off. Yeah. Okay. And as, as RJ was dealing with, he had trouble performing tasks when his phone kept breaking every five minutes. Um, yeah. Less than that, actually. But. Yeah. Okay. Beth, <coughs> okay. I have a question. How many, do you have a sense that people were contacting you using their cell phones, looking at the town website to get contact information? I mean, people were definitely looking at the town website because yeah. they were getting information off it. But not everybody, because a lot of people are just in like, you know, what do I do now mode. We did. And so it depends on the people. So would but, it make sense to have... Oh, the thing we did on, was it Wednesday? Tuesday morning. When did we post that flyer? When did we walk around oh, the flyer? Oh, I thought it was the radio station. Was that Wednesday morning? I think that was Wednesday, it was Wednesday morning. morning. The yeah. flyer thing was great. That was, I, yeah. I thought that was where we went. So we put together we, a flyer I think there was on more. regular paper with yeah, a whole bunch of resource information, mm -hmm. including the town's website, um, but lots of a bunch of things. Like we can't get, like we're trying to get dumpsters, we just can't get them because um, that was the reality. The reality is we were that constantly was, trying to get that dumpsters. That was bad when people still needed to call two one one a lot. And people couldn't get through on 211, so we said go to the website and log your thing on 211 on the website instead of calling. Um, anyway. would, it, would it have made sense to be able to take the Johnson Town of Clerk number, the, what is it, 2166 or whatever, and have that automatically switch to the EOC? Phone? It's 2611, and have it forwarded. It's three lines. Yeah. To, have, to be able to have, because I mean, that would be a lot of people's first. Would the municipal building flooded the EOC 
number was Beth's cell phone. Yeah. But would it make sense to be able to do to that and it. sometimes say, okay, we need this number to, to call forward? I mean, you can call forward. You probably even know how to do it. Yeah. Unless you need both lines. Wow. Yeah. But I mean, it would seem to me to make sense to be able to have a way to call forward. Because yeah, we need to have a whole communication plan. We need to have a communication plan. If the town office floods, we need to have a communication plan. If it doesn't, and right. it needs to fall in the, everyone in this room, whether, whether they're retired or not. Yeah. <laughs> well, you see a lot of excitement coming from this. <laughs> <Exactly. side. laughs> well, it would be interesting to be able to do that for, for phones to be able to just call forward to like got a person answering. Well, the town clerk's office used to, I don't know if we still do, this is getting into the weeds and we don't need to do that, but the, the answering machine did have a call for if you had an emergency with a water. We, we, did, we did change the message at one point, I just don't know when. We'll, our office would volunteer to work with whoever down the road to come up with emergency communications. I don't worry, you'll be part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Roger. <laughs> Because I know you and uh, Evan and I had a conversation about radios and other stuff for the EOC down the road. Because as I was talking to him on the phone, you were calling him, or I was getting calls from Eric. So there was a constant phone call. It goes well beyond our, those four people. I, I, know we, I know the three of us <laughs> sat in one of these rooms for like five minutes and our phone didn't ring. <laughs> Did you have them on? They're <laughs> on. Uh, okay. We feel good about where we're landing here. So we're. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, does anybody else want to add anything? Are we on the Wednesday now? Yeah. Yeah, but we're just doing the first forty-eight. Just. Yeah. You would step. Just in. a little bit into Wednesday. Wednesday noonish. Our first dumpster was Thursday. We're not touching that. So the flyers. Wednesday is 6 a.m. So the flyers. Uh, Eric, how many is there? Uh, uh, did the, uh, the flyer. Flyer. Did you, did you let the water out? Yeah, you yeah, get that. <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> Actually, they did that when I ran in front of the garden. They, they first re entered the sewer treatment plan at 6 a.m. Wednesday. <laughs> I will say, parts of that one still got in but they they went out trash pumps. Well, they came up here with contact boots and shoes and clothes, clothes and water. Oh. Yeah. Johnson from Johnson yeah. Farm and Garden. Oh, they deserve yeah, they they came up with one, one, one truck out. and stuff. The yeah. Naughty Sisters vape shop or what's it called? Two sons. No, it's the no. distillery, dispensary. dispensary. Oh. Two oh. sisters dispensary, I think. Yeah, that one. Uh, they, the gentleman and one of the ladies that was here showed up with a six by 10 foot enclosed trailer filled with stuff. They went to both New Hampshire and got it. That was after the Red Cross had taken the shelter, so it was like Thursday morning, but. A couple days after a flood, you can get a lot of water. Yeah. It was, it was seven forks at 6 p.m. I arranged it. Yeah. Yeah. It was last yeah. 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 so, yeah. Speaking of which, Jason, is there any chance you could stop at some point with a bucket loader and pick up? There's still like a pallet of those. Wipes on the on Bobby Hoag's lot. I think yeah. Mike said that he would pick them up. Who like did? The teachers who brought them so that they would pick them up. Last time I talked to Greg, he said they're yours. <clears throat> but, That's not very um, nice. Well, you say me and Evan talked about this a little bit, and we were, I was leaving them there for people that wanted them because they're totally fine, but like new in box. But Greg doesn't want them back, so. I'm yeah, I don't know what we're gonna do them, but I hate to leave them. You know, I hate to leave them at lobbies just because. Yeah, sure. I, I hadn't mentioned it before. Oh, okay. I guess. Bring them to Duncan's. Paul Duncan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Just well played. Just I like it. Do we need a motion for that? Uh, yeah. What do you guys want to do with them? I don't know. Okay. 
You got a dumpster out back, Asia. We Probably can stage them. If we get or what re pops up somehow, we can put them in the uh, resource distribution area. Yeah, the problem is now those boxes are yeah. 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 melted. Okay, yours, Jason. They're all yours. I heard they were dumping snowflakes. <laughs> <laughs> if I see the loader coming up, Clay, you know I'm running. Okay, I think we're ready to wrap, yeah? Great. Okay. Unless anybody else has anything all. pertinent to add. If you think of anything that we didn't capture in the timeline, let us know and we'll throw it in. You're going to look to get a report from dispatch that may help out. Do, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. cool. And then at some point we'll have a follow-up on uh, a revised plan and lessons learned kind of thing. Okay, so select board. We still have one yes. matter of business. We can take 10 seconds right now. I want to say thank you again for all the brothers for you. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you everybody, yes, yes, thank you. I'm surprised that he didn't have a word to say. Yeah, but he's starting to charge by the word if you think. You guys want a little briefing on the public works department? I did a Well, next month then? I would just. I did the review. Ah, uh, that we're doing, working you. on the grant project up there on the Nowhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, anyone yeah. cares? I don't. Yeah, I think we can miss that. We have a phone there. Unless it's already done. I did it, but I didn't send it because it wasn't on the thing. So I was like, well, there. That's All right. Well, it's a good practice. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Are we are we doing here. your executive no. session <laughs> thing, Beth? Should we move to another room so we can get it? I need to make a motion. Well, I'll tell you what. Say one thing. Beth, sure. Uh, I guess what I wanted to say was uh, a lot of the questions were about the water's at a certain level in one place, you know, how come we're not going to find that it's going to be a certain level somewhere else? It's sort of half science and half art. You know, the, the National Weather Service is a huge, huge asset, and you use them every way you can. The river gauge, that's an asset. Uh, what Roger and his department is observing in uh, Wolfe is an asset. But every event's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Depending on what's happening with the Gaion, as you found out, um, it can really change the dynamics of what the event's going to be. What yeah. direction it hits in the building. Where it hits, how it hits. Uh, 95 was the second. Um, that was the third highest. That's so, right. Don't try to claim fame for that one anymore. <laughs> That, the Guyon had a figure in that. Right, that was true. And uh, Romeo's, uh, or uh, Howard's place, really took a beating of flooding. This event, it didn't even get into it. So, 95 is water with that outer house bridge door line. Yeah. And that's pretty hot. So, it, it, uh, they're all good tools. It's good information. But there's still a little bit of, you know, art to it. And depending on what's happening with the rain from the storm, a good rule of thumb is when it's raining out, when the rain stops, it's about a six hour lag where the Lamont will be. Mm -hmm. But you know, even that's a you know, That's how the art. That's the art. art. <laughs> it can change depending on where that rain was. Well, um, Jeffersonville, Cambridge was quick to point out that they didn't get a lot of rain. It was all Johnson's fault. I'm like, well, we got a lot of rain and a lot of water, so yeah, we keep looking really upstream. This is a huge watershed that comes. Guess what? Oh, yeah. Water runs it's, downhill. It's all, all the grass area, half of Walden, Greensboro, uh, you know, uh, Elmore. Basically. It all comes through here. Everything. Half a snow. And when they open the Walden. floodgates at Fairfax Dam, the water disappears out of Johnson. I don't know how much they have for floodgates there, do they? One thing that Evan did say that we could put in our lessons learned at some point is should we be asking more spill? We should be asking people upstream, the reservoirs upstream, to release before a big event so that they have more capacity to retain water. Maybe they do that. I, I don't know. 
it would that goes to my you know, point a couple meetings ago that there really needs to be a yeah. river basin coordinated planning yeah. process for yeah. Yeah. this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think this whole process is great and, and you will have learned things from this event, but you know, every event's a little bit different. But, uh, yeah, and given the changes, I mean, you two plan? years ago, oh, you really convinced me that we might have had a forest fire. It was just so dry. I think they had a, uh -huh. didn't they have a five acre brush fire in Eden two years ago, or was it three years ago? But that, five acres can get out of hand very quickly. We're having a forest fire emergency. Well, we were in severe drought before this. No, I know what I'm saying. Hopefully there's things from this emergency that will roll over into everyone, but they're all different. There, yeah. there is, because you may need shelter, you may need the same thing, the resources, the emergency response that you had for this. Yeah. But it may be a different limitations on roads that are going to be closed versus open and all that. But no, I think, I think you're on with it. <laughs> It means a lot coming from a retiree. Yeah. You know, are you trying to prepare? Hey, you went, hey, wow. went over here. Yeah. You went through yeah. plenty of these. Are you trying to prepare a motion for us to go into executive session? Beth, I don't believe we need Jason for the executive session. No, Jason, you're off the hook. Thank you for coming. Yeah, no problem. Provide me as well. Yeah, I'll thank you. I don't want to. You don't have to, but you can pay taxes yeah, and you're yes. welcome to every public meeting we have. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was that? Poor man. Vacation all that? Did you guys go fishing? Yeah. No? Okay. Who, who okay, caught the biggest one? Okay, we're going to do the show on the road. We're still on the road. Yes. Ryan told me you caught the biggest one. No, you're not. Okay, ready? Yes. Um, I make a motion to go into executive session per 1VSA 313A1. When the public body has made a specific finding that premature general public knowledge would clearly place a state municipality or other public body, body or person involved as a substantial disadvantage, period. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Let's have it. Executive session at 843. So, so that's a two states motion, right? So now we actually need to vote to go into executive session. Aye. I have a motion to enter to, into executive session. For the reasons she just stated. Yep. Exactly. Second. All right. Uh, in favor? Aye. 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 I don't believe there's any action coming out, Donna. Am I wrong? There won't be action. There will be? There won't be. Um, yes. there won't be. So do you need to say anything more about what the executive session is about other, other than it's under A1? Like, is it? It's because the discussion could put the town at but, a legal disadvantage. But legal disadvantage? So it's like legal. a legal issue? Yeah. Okay. Potential. Legal. Potential legal issue. Stand up again. Boy, Pastor. Okay.